Hello everyone, I am Professor Paul Carrier of the Western Michigan University Thomas M. Cooley Law School. And what I'd like to do now is to provide some information that should be helpful as you prepare for Class 4 of Contracts 2. Before I do that, however, I want to explain something that I try never to do. In this case, it's just not possible. I try to handle one major area of contracts law per class. And so that we start an issue and we finish that issue in that same week so that you have a closure, a sense of the entire product before we move on to a new area. We jump into a new box. That is not possible in this particular case because I need five, I need four or maybe four and a half hours of class time to fully cover conditions. And then for class five, it would be anticipatory repudiation, which doesn't need an entire three hours. And so what I'm probably going to do is cover conditions for class four. And, and this is the unfortunate part, but get your minds around it. At the beginning of class five, I will finalize the treatment of conditions, and then we will stop conditions. And probably from the second hour, move into anticipatory repudiation in class five. And so by the time we're done with classes four and five, we will have done conditions through the third hour, through the fourth hour, then into, into class five. Then the remainder, anticipatory repudiation, and then we'll have taken care of both of those topics. But keep in mind that you want to treat them as distinct, even though, unfortunately, some of class four will actually bleed into class five. Okay. Uh, also, there is quite a lot going on, and so I'm going to, in this presentation, uh, present some of the more important ideas, and it'll be somewhat quick, but I promise you that we'll go over it in more detail in the class. And also, it should be relatively apparent uh, as, you, uh, as, you do, as you read through the materials and you do your briefs. Okay, with uh, one of the problems with conditions. We talked about conditions last week and how the failure of a condition precedent prevents the other side's duty from arising. So if you don't deliver by that Friday, I don't have to pay you anything. And so whatever you've done is worthless to me. And you have to go do something else with it. And as you can see, that can lead to significant forfeiture. Okay? One side walks away, free and clear. The other side has been performing and gets nothing. Conditions subsequent work a little bit differently because there is duty. There's ongoing duties on both sides of the equation for a contractual relationship and then when something doesn't happen one party's duty stops then okay but it still leads to a forfeiture courts don't like that and so courts have developed quite a few ways to get around forfeiture uh, and we talked about a few last week but this week there are some more and they include um, implied conditions or implied aspects of conditions. And so, for example, in the Shaw case, and I'll make this as brief as I can for now, we have a rental agreement for a gas station. And we have a different agreement for buying the gas and petroleum products. Okay? But they're between the same parties. They are just two separate agreements. This one says, if you make enough money selling the gas and giving us some of that money, you don't have to pay us extra rent. However, if you don't make enough from those sales, then you have to pay us a minimum rent, which is X. The other contract was for the supply of gasoline and petroleum products. Basically, it was a requirements contract. As much as you need, we'll send you. Okay? So, as long as the gas station ordered enough gasoline and products, it sold more than enough to cover its minimum rent, and then it never had to pay that minimum rent. Okay? problem was the 1973 oil embargo and the uh, gasoline company, it was mobile, was unable to provide as much as the gas station had ordered. And so because the gas station didn't get enough of it, the product, it didn't have enough sales to make enough money for mobile to go beyond the minimum rent. In fact, it went under the minimum rent and then the gas station had to pay the minimum rental, which it did not want to do. And it blamed mobile for not giving it enough gasoline and petroleum products, which was true. The court said that those two contracts and those two sets of obligations, your duty to pay based on sales, but if you fall below it, you have to pay the minimum rent, was mutually dependent 
on mobile's duty to provide you as much as you could possibly sell. And in that case, if you ordered more and sold more uh, than, than, than was necessary to pay the minimum rent, you never had to pay the minimum rent. So the court said that those were mutual conditions. And if mobile failed to provide enough petroleum products, then the obligation to pay the minimum rent was suspended. So in other words, these two were mutually dependent covenants. And I'll briefly tell you about an independent covenant just so you get your minds around it. You rent an apartment. The landlord has certain duties to make sure that the garbage is picked up, the light bulbs in the hallway are working, etc., etc. Okay? If the landlord doesn't fix the light bulb, you're not allowed to walk out. Okay? You can lower your rent, perhaps. You can sue for breach, but it is not enough for you to walk out. It's not a constructive eviction. Those are treated as independent covenants. You must continue to pay your rent, okay? You can sue or you can try to lower the payment because of the landlord's breach of taking care of it. But those are independent. So just because something small goes wrong on the landlord's part doesn't free you from your obligation to pay the rent. You can still seek compensation for the problem, but you're not allowed to stop paying rent because those are mutually independent covenants. Okay, so hopefully you get your minds around the dependent kind, which we saw in Shaw versus Mobile Oil Company, and the independent kind, which I just mentioned in the lease agreement, which is a contract, by the way, the lease agreement scenario. Uh, okay, uh, another thing that courts do, this is a common law concept, uh, is the idea of substantial performance. And this is implied, it's like an implied condition or an implied contractual uh, reality, even when the parties don't do some themselves. The idea is where somebody on one side of a contract in the common law comes very, very close, but not full, not fully performing based on the terms of the contract. That is nevertheless substantial performance, and the other side has to pay. Okay? Maybe at a reduced payment. Maybe it's deducting some damages, but can't walk out and say, you breached, I'm free. That would lead to too much forfeiture. In other words, if the small item is not fully finished at common law, that would not be a material breach, so it would not free up the other side from its performance. There may be an adjustment to that performance, but not a freedom from. Example, I paint your garage and I'm nine-tenths done, but the monsoon season hits a little bit early, so I can't finish. And then you say to me, well, you didn't finish painting the garage, I don't have to pay you anything. Okay? And maybe our agreement didn't mention that idea. I would argue at common law in, before the courts, I substantially performed. It wasn't my fault for the rest. And I could ask for quantum merit, but I could also ask for contractual performance. Make him pay the contract price minus maybe one-tenth because of the damage he suffered. But it wasn't my fault, and everything done was done perfectly. So I truly substantially performed, so he too on the other side has to perform. I think that he would be you because I made myself the painter. Okay, so you can use the substantial performance doctrine to avoid the forfeiture of losing the amount of nine-tenths of the contract because I've already done that. And another way around that is quantum merit, but I want you to understand that when you're dealing, the court can imply a condition that substantial performance is good enough. Okay, but uh, UCC Article 2 changes that. When you look at 2601, the perfect tender rule, you've got to provide the goods as the articles the goods as described in the agreement and if they do not conform to the agreement they are non-conforming and that allows the buyer to reject those goods so we don't even look at substantial performance are they conforming or not is a different question than substantial performance there is one potential exception and that is with 2-612 installment contracts and Let's say there are 12 performances once per month for a year. If one performance is non-conforming, the party is allowed to reject that performance, but not the other 11. In other words, it appears that, because of this rule, the proper execution of 11 of 12 performances is a substantial performance so that the other party can't treat it as full breach and not pay. Well, it can only treat as breach the one installment. So keep in mind that the courts don't like to use that terminology, but with regard to installment contracts, where one installment is a breach of that installment but does not substantially impair the value of the entire contract, then 
that one inadequate performance doesn't allow rejection of the rest, and so the concept is that the rest act as if they are substantially performed. Okay? Uh, that's a very good uh, essay question. That's a very good multiple choice question, so you might want to get your minds around that. Jacob's, Jacob and Young's was the coho pipe case. Uh, this is a common law services contract for construction. Somebody put in the wrong pipe. Inadvertently, but it was the wrong pipe. With the wrong piping, does that allow the person who ordered the construction of the building not to pay? Or does it require the contractor to rip down the half of the building to put in the right pipes? That's crazy. The pipes were a personal preference, but not that different. The ones that were used were not that different. So using the wrong pipe, nevertheless, was substantial performance, which may allow some reduction by way of damages, but still required the party that ordered the service to pay for the construction and couldn't enforce uh, this condition that you must use X pipe. There is a substantial performance. Contrast that with the roofing case, where some roofer put on a waterproof and probably a good roof, but used many of the wrong shingles. And so the roofing looked like a patchwork. And I, I suppose, we don't have a picture of it, unfortunately, that it looked ridiculous. And it was so aesthetically non-pleasing, the court held that that was a substantial breach, a material breach, and the woman did not have to pay unless and until the roofer had actually replaced the shingles or redone the roof. Okay? Um, Carter versus Sherburn, time is of the essence. In many examples, and this is particularly true with contracts for closing on real estate, if you don't put in that time is of the essence in the contract, courts try to treat it as not of essence. A few days late, a few weeks late, not a problem. If you do not want that, if you want to make the absolute closing date, final date, very, very clear, and the going beyond that's a breach, then you'd better make clear in your contractual arrangement that time is of the essence. Failing that, the courts give a little bit more wiggle room because often parties treat it that way. And if you, if you, if you uh, literally uh, uh, respect a time is of the essence clause, you can imagine the amount of forfeiture that could occur. So courts try to get around it when they can, okay? Um, printing Center of Texas, a very, very poor printing job was held to be uh, a material breach. And the courts did not imply substantial performance in that case. And if no substantial performance, no duty to pay. Capital Dodge, a person bought a truck, it's already started not working, and the person called and tried to have it fixed a few times. And it was still problematic now. Rejection, if the party rejected it, he could do that, and the courts could not put in a substantial performance condition, okay, because this is UCC 2-601. Same is true with revocation. If somebody accepts but then revokes for a substantial impairment, it gets closer to trying to make the parties get into some uh, a mode of agreement with a little flexibility, but still not required. So even under 2608 revocation, don't treat that like a substantial performance scenario. And hopefully we'll go over that in class a little bit more. What about a person driving through downtown Detroit on a regular basis, late hours, who has a bad spare in the car? Buys the car, drives it around, doesn't realize the spare is bad before he or she's accepted it. Okay? Can he or she reject because the spare is material, is a material breach, because the spare is in such poor shape? And the answer to that, at least in Michigan, is yes. Uh, the bad spare was so important to the safety of the person driving that car through downtown Detroit, I think it was on I-94, uh, that uh, the party was able to revoke acceptance of the entire vehicle. Okay, and then the other side, the car company argued, well, it's not a big deal, and we could, they could fix it, and they haven't yet had a flat yet, and so what's the problem? We substantially performed. That's ridiculous. But remember, under Article 2, except for that one exception with 2-612 installment contracts, you do not apply the substantial performance doctrine. Okay, uh, I will uh, pick up uh, next week on a few things, and we'll talk soon.